get up, get, get up, get up. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another great bonus episode of the Mets Dub Podcast. One of the most excited I've been about bonus episode to give you guys a great interview with the voice of the Mets, Wayne Randazzo. You guys probably know him very well. Wayne? Good to be here. Good to be with you guys, and uh, congratulations on your uh, podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate that. Wayne, first question for you. Going to start you off with uh, one of the, probably the hardest ones we're going to give you. What is America's best built boiler? <laughs> Peerless boilers, <laughs> uh, just like the commercial says. Uh, that's a great question. You know, Howie and I read a lot of things uh, along on the radio broadcast. We've got a lot of great sponsors. Bigelow Tea, of course, know, hot, hot or over ice, proudly. Yeah. Um, so it's right, hot over ice. <laughs> um, so that's a big one, and, and Peerless boilers, and. And many others. Uh, there's Howie right there making faces really? at us oh. through his Peerless hey. Boilers. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's all good. Glad, glad Peerless Boilers are getting a good, nice plug. Get a nice plug on the podcast. Yeah. So as guys who are kind of like starting our baseball talk journey a little bit here with the podcast and stuff, we're interested to see, like, how did you get started? What made you really want to become a baseball broadcaster? Yeah, I wanted to do this uh, since I was a little kid, really. I mean, I, I just loved watching baseball. I grew up in Chicago, and I, there were you know two teams there, too. So get to see the National League when the Cubs were playing whoever and the White Sox playing whoever in the American League. So it was really a good baseball education as a kid. You know, I loved Harry Carey, and he just made the game so fun. I mean, it, it didn't matter if the Cubs were... 30 games out of first, which they often were. And uh, <laughs> the games are important because Harry was calling them and, and making them sound exciting. If the Cubs would win on a walk-off hit, he'd go crazy. And it just seemed like a, a cool thing to do. So uh, I, I wanted to follow it as I got older. You know, I realized probably couldn't do what Harry did. But, um, you know, there's other broadcasters I really liked and, and guys I, I tried to emulate or, or be like. And um, you know, really worked out to just follow that path. Really, my whole my whole life was wanting to be a baseball announcer, and to, to be able to do it, especially here in New York with the Mets, has been has been awesome. That's amazing. And also, just like you're so accomplished in this field for like your age, like it's amazing to see like yeah, how he's old, like how he's old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> guys. Yeah, I mean, Gary's not Gary's no spring chicken anymore. You mentioned Harry, and you mentioned wanting to emulate other broadcasters growing up. Anybody else come to mind? Uh, yeah, a lot of, you know, Pat Hughes was, was still really good. He's the radio voice for the Cubs and a guy who's been doing it since 1996, I think was his first year doing Cubs games. So same year we were born. Yeah, yeah exactly. We were born That's how these jobs go. You know, <laughs> think about if you wanted to grow up broadcasting the Dodgers. I mean, it was an impossible task for a couple generations uh, until Vin finally retired and, and Joe took over. But, you know, I think it was uh, guys like Pat Hughes and, um, I don't know if I could say his name anymore because he's a, a bad boy, but Tom Brenneman was um, <laughs> somebody that I really liked growing up. <laughs> and um, a lot of guys, you know, that were that were good broadcasters, John Rooney with the White Sox. And, um, you know, as I got older, started listening more around the league, listening to Howie and, and Gary and, and listening to Eric Nadell, who does the Texas Rangers, and John Miller and Vin. Um, you know, a lot of guys that I, I tried to steal little things from all, along the way. What's it been like sharing the booth with Howie and Gary, you know, through radio and TV? Yeah, it's cool. I mean, they're they're just so good. You know, people don't really understand what it takes to put a, a major league broadcast together at a high level like that. And Howie and Gary show up every to every game they do um, trying to make it the best broadcast they possibly can make it on that particular day. I've learned a lot from those two guys. Um, you know, I started here in 2015 doing pre and post and – I would ask Howie all sorts of questions, and, and Gary, too, and they were so good about uh, giving answers, but also just watching them every day, watching how they approach an interview or how they approach asking the manager a question or how they approach a, a serious situation. We've certainly had those over the years. Oh, yeah. um, you know, We did the game right after Jose Fernandez passed away in Miami and watching how they went about approaching that kind of broadcast yeah. or a, a championship uh, game or series or what playoff game type atmosphere how they approach that so just the little things that you pick up along the way I mean, they they it's like a master level class that I've gotten over the years and I've been really lucky to learn from them the way I have I remember that Hiron Fernandez game very vividly it was a Monday evening that game in Miami I remember when I was in college I used to like be doing things at night so I'd always put Howie in my ears and listen to the Mets game and there was some not so great Mets team. So I just remember the yeah. the monologue he gave that night just yeah. about Jose Fernandez and about like youth yeah. 
in baseball in general. Like I, I got like half a goosebump when you even just brought it up. <laughs> yeah, it was really, it was like doing a game at a funeral. It really was. It was uh, such a sad atmosphere in Miami. The Marlins players were in tears most of the game. Uh, I remember doing an, an on-field interview after the game with Justin Bohr, and, and he could barely focus on what I was asking. It was just such a strange atmosphere to do a baseball game in. But also you want to do it justice from a broadcast standpoint. You want to make sure that you're – telling the story in a way that uh, really resonates with our listeners or viewers on, on the TV side and uh, to, to do Jose's life justice and to make people kind of feel what they were feeling on the field. And I, I think uh, the way that we did it that night was really special. And, and I think we did as much as we could in that, in that scenario. Just to switch gears, it's been kind of sad now. What um, <laughs> You mentioned changing from pre and post game to getting – into the booth. I believe that was 2019. Yeah. What was that transition like? And then how was it building rapport with Howie? Or did you have one anyway, just from being a part of the yeah. kind of radio family anyway? Yeah, yeah, it was really seamless. It was really an easy transition. Uh, I, I'd done a lot of games anyway, and had been around with, with Howie anyway. So uh, it was really fine. You know, it was it was easy for me to slide in there and, and do all the games. And it was fun. I mean, it was it was a good it was kind of a fun year, you know, 2019. Yeah, with Pete. definitely. Uh, coming up the way he did, and the team kind of went on a, a nice run and made it an interesting second half. It's not quite like this year where they're just, you know, dominating a lot of the time. A little better. And, yeah, this is a little better. But, um, you know, I really I remember doing some of the playoff games in 2015, and uh, I'd really like to do some more. I mean, that would be really fun to, to get an opportunity to call division series and championship series and World Series games here. I mean, this place, even last night, was was crazy. and. Uh, it's it's still August, so uh, I hope that we get get some opportunities this year to do that. Yeah, team's been great. How are you feeling about the Mets so far in 2022? Feel good, yeah, feel really good. The uh, you know I, I think what we've seen is a team that's really come together in the second half. They refined the roster on the trade deadline. Uh, you bring in Vogel back and Naquin, and uh, you bring in uh, Darren Ruff. I mean, these were guys that are established big leaguers, not stars, but but good solid players, and they've really refined the roster that this team already has. There's already a lot of star power here. Definitely. So I, I think just kind of touching up the way that they did was smart. Um, and I think this team has looked like a, a, a championship-level team. You know, you get into October, who knows what's going to happen? You know, who knows what teams are going to look like at that point? Who's going to be hot at that point? But you just want to put yourself in the best position when you get there. And I think to this point, the Mets seem like they, they are doing that. And you got you got to finish up these last seven weeks or whatever and – and lock this division down because you don't want to get stuck in that in that wild card round. I don't think no against way. the Padres or whoever else end up having to play the Dodgers early. So I think you can kind of write your own ticket if you win the division. It's funny to think about. It. You mentioned doing the playoff games in 2015, but watching from television, those games are always national. Like we don't get the same type of Mets or like your own local feel when you do that. Mm. But that's a whole different perspective with the radio. I think that also like comes to a bit of a like a broader understanding about baseball games on television versus the radio. So is there is there anything else that you want to like talk on about the difference in consumption between the baseball on TV, and baseball on radio? Like the yeah. pro, especially now you've done both too. Yeah, and I think there's a, a, another wrinkle with social media when it comes to it too because you have um, you know, you have social media being such a large part of the TV viewing experience. Yep. You know, you you're you're sitting there you're kind of a captive audience. You're participating in a way with the, the TV broadcast and, and, and the, your fellow fans that are watching. And I think that, you know, when it comes to TV, there's, there's just more of a, a focus on, on what you're watching in the game. Whereas if you're listening on the radio, you're usually doing something else. You know, yeah. not often are you just sitting there listening to the radio. You know, you're, you're kind of in the car or you're in the backyard or you're grilling or whatever. You're in the garage. Um, so it's not as interactive as it was with the audience, I don't feel like. But I, I do think that there is still a romanticism about baseball on the radio that I think is different than on TV. And I think it's, um, you know, really lucky to be able to do the radio broadcast for the Mets because I think it's got a, it's a, it's a big fan base. There's a lot of people driving around. There's always a lot of traffic in New York. Yeah, so tons. <laughs> we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're keeping uh, people company. And uh, I think on TV – it's a, of course, it's a different call too. You know, it's TV. You're really just captioning what people are, are seeing. Mm -hmm. Whereas radio, you're you need to tell them what what you're seeing. Um, so it's 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 a lot different. But it, you know, they're both fun, and 
they both have a different type of audience. And uh, I, th I think as an organization, the Mets are lucky to have fans that really trust the broadcast and enjoy the broadcast as much as they do. And uh, we're glad to give them. How have you been able to handle social media? Because I like coming from our side, like I, I'm basically yeah. social media for a job. You guys James, are social media. Yeah, James <laughs> does social media. So how do you, you guys like in the booth, how do you yourself handle using social media? Yeah, I know, you know, I'm a, uh, getting back to the age, not to not to make a big deal about it, but being younger, you know, has kind of grown up in a technological way and, and understanding social media a little bit differently. You know, how he's kind of taken over his Twitter account and made it a... <laughs> Made it a sounding board for whatever topic yeah, the, he likes. Or, the banger yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he does that every once in a while. Um, you know, uh, so he's he's been able to use. I know Keith gets on it a little bit, but um, you know, I think it's fun to just interact with the audience and and just kind of uh, take your opinion to uh, a written form a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes what we say in the radio just kind of goes into the ether. Uh, it's it's forgotten as soon as it's said. Whereas you know, if you tweet it, you're kind of putting your stamp on uh, what your opinion is or whatever thing about the Weather Channel, how he tweets about it. <laughs> uh, you know, you just it's a, it's just a different way to connect with the audience. And from a listener's perspective, it's fun that you guys have started getting more into it. I remember I think it was two or three years ago. It might have been your first year when that Mets booth account actually finally came to be. Yeah. And I was like, is this us? Like, who's tweeting this? I didn't tweet this. Did you tweet this? Just, I don't know. It's just. It's fun listening to you guys on the radio yeah. and hearing that. Has it been kind of a different challenge this year going back and forth from TV to radio? No, I, I've done a little bit. You know, Gary doesn't miss many games, first no. of all. So, you know, some TV guys, they'll miss 30 or 40 games, and yeah. it will be a, it'll be a lot more of a, a balance between TV and radio. We kind of have a running joke that, like, the Mets, like, backup broadcasting unit is better than, like, <laughs> most teams, like, starting broadcasting unit between you to TV and then Jake. Yeah, or even, or even the, the crazy the Terry Collins or Eddie Coleman <laughs> drop-ins on the radio. Those games are always fun. Yeah, yeah that's true. A, a deep bench nowadays. Yeah, uh, it, like yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, Terry's, uh, Terry's been fun to have around. Ed, you know, keeping his toes in is good. Um, but, yeah, doing the, the TV broadcast is, is really fun. And uh, Keith and Ron are unbelievable analysts. Uh, I mean, you know, Keith, I think people don't realize how good of an analyst he is. It, you, you think about Keith, and he's just – wayward personality and he's just got all these jokes and all these things that he wants to to add on to the broadcast from a humorous standpoint and he's a wild card you never know what he's going to say next <laughs> but also he's a really good baseball analyst yeah really you good. know he really knows the game he really understands hitting and defense and uh, even how a pitcher is working and of course ron is is so articulate and and so uh thoughtful in in his a analysis but but keith is too and doing games with the two of them together it's like the easiest thing in the world I yeah mean, really it is it, you just you guide a little bit of the conversation they talk to each other you call some plays and three hours later you, you go home <laughs> it's really really fun and and uh, i enjoy doing the games with them whenever uh, gary needs a quick pinch hitter as we know with everyone's broadcasting career you kind of go through some weird spots weird jobs that you end up <laughs> having what would you say is the weirdest job that you had through yours yeah, I didn't have many weird broadcasting jobs. I did do Ultimate Frisbee once. Uh, oh, that, that's, for, that's the one. <laughs> for, yeah, yeah, I did ESPN. I did Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, I did like a 4th of July tournament and a Memorial Day tournament one year for, for Ultimate Frisbee. It was pretty cool. I mean, it was different. Not like I wanted to be uh, the Vince Scully of Ultimate Frisbee <laughs> or anything, but it was, it was still a good experience. I had more weird jobs like in the off season. Because uh, I did minor league baseball in Alabama for a while. Oh my God! Um, what city? So, Mobile. Wow. Yeah, it was good. It was fun. It was a. It was not a bad place to start in. You know, you feel like you you might start in like the smallest little town in the in the country. And Mobile was a pretty mid sized town, um, but it was like you know I sold suits for a few weeks one off season. I drove a cab for a couple weeks one wow. off season. Here? I just no, no in the Chicago area, but just yeah. like. Uh, just stuff to get me paid for a few weeks at a time before I couldn't take it anymore. And yeah, <laughs> those are tough jobs. Those are not those are not jobs that are uh, that, that are you know I would take lightly. They they you, you need to really pour yourself into like being a cab driver. It's like twenty hours a day. Yeah. So I, I wasn't cut out for the good for the people that are, but I I am was absolutely not cut out for it. Is it strange you mentioned your Chicago Cubs fandom and you do these games and you guys are animated? Howie's got to be one of the biggest Mets yeah. fans on the face of the earth. Is it <laughs> is it bizarre juggling like a like a childhood or like a younger fandom with now the job? Not too much, you know. I don't think it's any different for the players either. You know, yeah. That's a good point. The players are Mets. 
and they want to win when the when they win the Mets are excited that the Mets are winning and I think uh, as a Mets announcer I'm excited when the Mets are winning I, I I'm competitive too and I want to see them win and um, you know and I want to deliver these big moments and calls and and do them justice you know it's uh, that that day when Keith Hernandez had his number retired and they had this weird wacky win and yeah. against the Marlins and you want to d- deliver that and um, you know that's that's kind of where where my heart is when it comes to this stuff and if we're lucky enough to call playoff games and, and World Series games it, it'll just be a, another example of that we just want to live up to the moment and um, you know I don't think any fandom that I might have had as a kid really is any reflection of that now yeah uh, um you know it was weird a little bit in 2015 in the championship series mets won the pennant at wrigley field yep um why well, I, I spent a lot of time as a kid so it was it was just odd being in that place standing on the pitcher's mound watching the mets celebrate winning the pennant <laughs> but it was it was good i was happy and i was glad that the mets were moving on and the cubs weren't you talked about some of the great calls you mentioned the nimmo wacky one what call do you think in your career has really stood out the most to you uh, probably at this point, I, you know, Alonzo's 53rd homer was probably my number one. It was it just happened to fall in my inning doing the radio game. But TV was was national that night, um, so really, I have I have the only Mets call of, of Pete Alonzo's 53rd homer, which was a big moment. It was setting the rookie home run record. You know, this place was pretty uh, anticipatory of that moment, and um, I, I I remember a few weeks before that. He had set the Mets record. He broke Todd Huntley and, and Beltron's Mets record. Um, and I asked Howie to listen to the call. And, you know, Howie's really good about giving advice about what he thinks was good about a call or maybe what could have been a little bit better. And he gave me a little bit of advice uh, about the home run, the, the Mets home run, the Mets record home run. And so I thought, well, you know, next time I call a milestone homer, which could be 10 years from now, I'll try to remember that. But it was only a few weeks because Alonzo had so many big home runs that year. And I, I took some of what Howie said and, and added it to that, and I thought it was I thought it turned out pretty nicely. Is there any other like little tidbits that Howie's given you? Because Howie comes from this incredible Mets lineage <laughs> of broadcasters with yeah. Lindsey Nelson, Bob Murphy, Ralph Kiner, Howie Rose, and kind of we're dragging out to the future. So any other yeah. piece of advice stick out? Um, you know, I I think really the the best thing that we do that comes from Howie, and Howie says really the two years he spent doing radio with Gary was very educational for him. Because uh, Gary was so good at doing the radio, but just knowing when to step on the gas uh, on a broadcast, when we can, we should really be focusing on the game, and also when it's okay to be uh, more comical or or have fun with something or or whatever the case may be. Just knowing when to pick your spots on 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 when to be uh, more focused on the game and when to be more focused on whatever we're talking about in the booth. I think those are the two uh, the two things that stand out to me the most about what works with Howie and and what works is with him as an announcer. I think, you know, when I first started, I was probably too rigid, too focused on being good fundamentally and and not really showing personality or or being fun on the broadcast. And now I think I think that's all out the window. I think Howie's brought that out uh, because you know as as fundamentally sound as he is, he's, he's extremely good at calling plays and highlights and um, giving details, but he's also hilarious. And yeah. I, I think that there's, um, there's, it's not easy to do that. And if you listen around the league, you don't find too many guys who can. Well, it's funny because we actually had a little bit of that ourselves because we'd been doing the podcast for a year on our own in my apartment in Astoria. And when we got with the Mets, all of a sudden, not that we tightened up, but you do, you kind of feel like a little bit of pressure of like, okay, now we have to be... Well, yeah, the lights right. are on. We have to be very professional. Yeah. So it's really interesting to hear coming from your perspective, too. And I think that's one of the things that Mets fans love about the radio broadcast with you guys is that it just feels like you're hanging out talking yeah. about the Mets game going on. And I'm assuming that's something you guys really try to emulate a lot. Yeah, I, I think it comes naturally, too. I don't know that we're trying to, to make that convey that message. I think we are just doing that. I, I think we're just having a good time in the booth. Um, and then when it's crunch time, when it's really an important moment in the game, we're f- hyper focused on it. And I, I think just trying to match the emotion of the fans is is something that's important to us. But uh, you know, it's mostly organic to us. You know, the only time we really probably had to put out put it on at all was when we were sitting in this very room doing road games uh, in 2020 and, and 2021. Um, I think at that point you're not really there and 
feeling what you should be feeling to, to call the game. So we might have had to put on a little bit of, of an act maybe for that. But um, otherwise, I think what you hear is, is pretty much how we feel, and, and it's coming on, out through the air. And appreciate you saying that, because I think what you said was is really what a broadcaster should strive to make it sound like. How was it doing those COVID games in an empty room, empty ballpark? It sucked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plain and simple. It was horrible. Um, you guys still talk about that like all the time yeah, on the broadcast. We have, yeah, we have uh, – we have, <laughs> it's in our minds. It's, it's something that is, uh, we're, we have some trauma about because it, it was horrible. You know, it's not the way that you should be broadcasting Major League Baseball. Um, there's, it's, a, it's a long season. It's every day. Yep. You have to be around uh, to really understand what the players are going through and what the players are thinking and what the manager's thinking. You have to just be around. Um, so to not, to not be around was tough. And to not experience the atmosphere and, uh, you know, we're talking about Dodger Stadium. The Mets are playing at Dodger Stadium. But we're not in it. Yeah. So we're not feeling what it feels like to be at Dodger Stadium, which is a, an incredible place. You know, I, I know John and Susan did. Uh, sorry. I know they, they did <laughs> the uh, the games in London off of a TV. Yeah, it's got to be impossible. How could you do that? Uh, or no, it was not the London game. It was the Iowa game. It was the Field of Dreams. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How could you do that without – being at the none of us have ever been there no. to do a major league baseball it was the first one they ever had so how could you really have what the experience is like uh come across the air when you're not there yourself yeah it, it just is not the way it, it should have been done and i'm glad really happy that we are not doing it that way. <laughs> being in the ballpark obviously makes a huge difference and at home games we've started to interact with players now and we start to get our own stories is there any story with the players maybe even from the 2015 team that is like one that is kind of funny or sticks out <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's been a lot over the years that, that have stood out. You know, I know that um, some guys really like, you know, Todd Frazier was somebody who's always telling stories and talked about working as a, a carny at some, uh, you know, <laughs> festival in New Jersey <laughs> and, uh, you know, how he was giving T-shirts out and getting yelled at. I mean, there's always weird stories that, that come through from the guys. Um, it's It's whether... Whether they're funny stories or just good baseball stories, you know, whatever we're after, um, you know, some guys will try to tell you how they feel about a certain situation without really coming out and saying it. Uh, some guys are very guarded about, you know, what they say. I, I remember Curtis Granderson would always give answers that seemed like he could, you know, well, it's baseball and sometimes you make it out and sometimes you get a hit. Well, yeah, thank you, Curtis, for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And, you know, Curtis is very smart and, and very good at, at even doing TV now. Yeah. So, But those answers are almost like, well, okay, that's I guess you don't really want to say what you're thinking. But um, some guys are really candid, some aren't. But it's it's just good to know even that, you know, what players are, are thinking and, and how they're going about uh, their business every day. And we were just seeing Lindor taking batting practice out here 20 minutes ago, four hours or more before the game. Yeah. Um in the middle of August after he's played every single day. So now we, and we've already asked him that this week, but just to go up to him and say, Hey, you know, you're up there taking BP at two 30 for a seven o'clock game, 115 games in, like, are you crazy? Or are you, <laughs> what, what is this? Why do you do this? So um, I, I think having a curiosity for how they do their jobs is really the best way to go about it. That's great insight. Are you, cause we don't really think about that as much because this is our first, on fans too. Is no one, no, not many people are here day after day after day, and we've kind of got a newfound understanding of that being here, and like you guys as well, just like being a part of this team's grind, like over and over and over again. It's like it's so unbelievably impressive that you guys are able to do this and stay as consistently spectacular as you do. Well, I appreciate that, but I don't, I don't know how they do it. I, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I want to know. Because you know, when you have a long night flying in somewhere, you get in at four a.m. and then you got to go broadcast the game the next day. That's tiring. Like. You you can you feel it after a, a few months of doing it, especially. But I don't know how they go out and perform, how, how they go out and play and throw and hit and and do it at such a high level. I mean, it really, these guys are unbelievable athletes. Uh, you know, I know fans say, well, this player stinks or whatever. They but they really don't. They are <laughs> they, so absolutely good. incredible athletes. Mark Canna moves to third base for the first time in six years. <laughs> has a one-hop rocket hit to him, <laughs> fields it, and throws it to first. Well. I mean, it's just unbelievable how good these guys are at this sport and, and just being athletes. Last question I'll ask you, because we have now started to indulge in the media food. Yeah. So who do you think around the league has the best food for media? <laughs> um, Phillies is pretty good. Phillies have a good ice cream selection. 
Um, <laughs> you know, that's uh, Frank uh, scoops our ice cream in Philly, and and that's always fun. Um, who else has a really good one? I feel like the, everybody's you know about the same at this point. Nobody's nobody really puts out the great media spreads that I that they always talk about. You know, this place used to have you know twenty five dollars steaks for eight bucks. <laughs> you know, who who knows if that's even true? But uh, <laughs> I feel like uh, the media spreads are okay in most places and. As long as they're edible, and if not, there's always the concession. <laughs> of a similar elk, where is your favorite road city to travel to, and then where's your favorite road ballpark to watch to be a part of the game? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll eliminate Wrigley and Chicago <laughs> as uh, hometown bias, even though I don't think I'm biased. Um, I would say the Giants have the best game presentation. Okay. Um, you know, when you go to certain ballparks, the music is so loud and blaring. And in San Francisco, just kind of a little bit more of a melodious tune there. And they kind of keep it on a, on a medium level uh, of noise. And their PA announcer who is, is really, really good and understated. I like Marisol. Marisol's oh, a really great. good she's awesome. dress announcer. Um, you know, it, but th- uh, they have a great game pre- presentation in San Francisco plus the water. And it's such a beautiful ballpark. I do love Dodger Stadium, though. It's uh, I wouldn't say their game presentation. Theirs is kind of the opposite, where it's very loud. <laughs> um, but, man, Dodger Stadium is cool. What a, what a great place to be at. So much baseball history. You know, you really don't get – all these ballparks are new. You don't really get the feeling of, of nostalgia and history unless you're at Dodger Stadium, Wrigley, and Fenway. And um, I hope those ballparks are last forever because they're, they're, they're the only ones left like it. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, so many great stadiums across the league. Wayne, thank you so much. I know yeah. you have to run. Uh, hopefully we'll Thanks get to talk lot. to you again soon. Your neck's not even that long. I, I, you know, that's what they tell me. Everybody <laughs> who meets me says my neck is about average size. Yeah. When I was 18, it looked a little bit differently. I guess I filled into my body, but we really appreciate All you right. coming out, doing this yeah. episode, and uh, hopefully we can talk soon. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot for having me. Get up. Get, get up. Get up.